All right, I feel your pain. Um, I was asked to do something about differentiation, but because that's so huge, um, I thought that in that trying to narrow everything down, I just couldn't. So I'm kind of infusing it in something that I'm very passionate about, which is um, the poverty and the impact of poverty on our society today, um, particularly our students. There, I looked around, there's not a school in here that is not going to encounter a, a, a student that comes from poverty. So I thought that it would be a good topic, so I'm kind of changing the game just a little bit, but it's because I'm passionate. You don't want me to sit up here and talk about something I'm not passionate about. Right, it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be fun. So very first thing I want to, um, I'm gonna, I, I'll just give you some um, background on the, the poverty piece and why it became so, uh, so I became so interested in it because I went to a Ruby Payne. Have you, have you heard of Ruby Payne? Um, not so much nowadays, but about five or six years ago, she was the hot person. She was the person, the go-to person for um, poverty because she wrote the book, um, Understanding Students from Poverty. And she talked about um, social norms and how to survive if you're very in from poverty and the, the social class, more or less. Okay, well then people were kind of a little leery about her because she, they felt like she was being discriminatory because of her, the, the people she was using as examples that are in her book. So they kind of stepped away from her. She thought, they didn't think she was very politically correct. Then the big name was Eric Jensen. You heard of him teaching students from, um, with poverty uh, and then engaging students from poverty. So I went to him three times. I mean, I think he started recognizing me in his audience. Um, and I found him to be the most knowledgeable about what to do to engage students. So that's the differentiation piece because he talks about it. So if you ever get to read the book, and more than likely if you're going to teach at Snipes, Freeman, Gregory, or Virgo, it would probably be a required reading at some point. That, it, that, that if you read him, um, you'll find him the most helpful in trying to understand um, where, where, we're, where it's coming from. I wanted to take some of his uh, key pieces and just share those with you. My, my PowerPoint's probably about six slides. It's not overwhelming, but because I only have like an hour, I have to compete <laughs> with the smell of pizza. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try to kind of uh, go very quickly. So his bottom line, those things that he wants you to understand are that um, kids from poverty are different. There's no, uh, if you go in thinking that you're going to be the savior or, or change anything, that's not gonna happen. At least it's not gonna happen just going there thinking about it. There's gonna be some things you have to do specifically. Um, the brains, they do adapt to sub-optimal uh, sub, um, conditions. They have to, because if you're in the constant stress of poverty and what that brings to you in, in a daily, day-to-day -day basis, it has, you, it has to be adaptable. Um, I'm gonna ask you to think about poverty in, in a sense that's not just um, financial, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Brains do change. Um, keeping that in mind, neurosurgeon, neurosurgery and uh, neo, neoplasticity, all those things, those are researches that you can find on in any book or um, TED Talks or anywhere, any place you like to research, Facebook, it's always talking about how the brain can change, and it really can. Um, and, but for them to change, we have to change, and it's not going to be very, it's not going to be easy. But um, those from poverty can succeed, and it's happening all over the country. So I encourage you, uh, there are lots of um, s stories about the terrible things that happen, but try to follow those positive ones, and those are the ones that are gonna give you what you need, that information. Let's see. Okay. Um, quick quiz, and then we're gonna do a little get up activity. True or false? Number one, what do you think? Let me just yell out the answer. Right, it may appear otherwise because of our perception. We are middle class citizens. Most of us, all of us in this class may be more, higher, but we are the typical norm for what we, the expectations, where we expect people to behave. Um, number two, what about that? Right. Um, it, it appears as though sometimes when you had that angry parent coming in the office, trying to blame the teacher is like, like, well, don't you value what your child is capable of having here? And it, it's not that. And we'll talk about why that happens in just a few minutes, too. What about number three? Okay. How about four? Um, 
we're, if we look at the population in this area, southeastern North Carolina, New Hanover County, um, proportionately more African Americans live in uh, poverty, but um, the, in, the, in the norm, it is not. And then number five. Absolutely. They're all false. So with that in mind, I'm just going to take a second. I have some things around the room. Um, I want you to think about my essential question here is, if a person is to come out of poverty or to leave that norm, what do you think would be the most important? What do you believe to be the most important factor for that to occur, right? I have physical. I have, what does that say over there? Spiritual. We have support systems. We have emotional, emotional capacity, the ability to um, control your emotions. Financial, of course, maybe, or boost, lottery, lottery ticket. Uh, mental, the uh, ability to um, think through, add, subtract, the mental capacity to handle things. And I have role models. Okay, so I, I, they're all important, but I need you to um, figure out one to be your most important. I'm gonna ask you to go there. When you get there, there'll be some people with you, hopefully. Um, and then I'd like you to discuss why you all chose that one. And then I'm gonna get you to get a spokesperson to share with the rest of us why you chose that. And see if you can kind of convince the others on why that's probably the most important factor. Any questions? All right, go forward. I guess the discussion is over. We're going to move forward. <laughs> oh, sorry. Was that your line, Ms. Marfield? OK. <laughs> uh, so in this, um, we've actually split the support systems group into two because um, there's so many of us over here. But we heard there's a lot of good arguments over there, so we're a little bit intimidated. Um, our basic focus was just that if the support system was in place, that um, you could get help with the other things, such as the finances, the spiritual peace, the mental health, so that the sports, um, excuse me, the support system was really the building block of um, trying to, you know, kind of change that mindset and move forward. Um, and I guess, I don't know if anybody, if I missed anything. Okay, I guess that'll be it for us. I'm gonna move on to spokesperson for the second half. We choreographed a dance, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think kind of going off what she said, we pretty much said the same thing, is that the support kind of takes all of it together and <laughs> puts it into one. So like personally in my life, and we were kind of saying in our lives, when we've needed financial support, when we've needed spiritual support or mental or emotional or what it, whatever it is, we've kind of gone to different like support systems in our own lives. So one might be a friend, one might be a parent, one might be, I don't know. And we just kind of said together that, we can't do life on our own, so we need the outlets of other people. Okay, spiritual. So I want to invite any of you to come in at any point if you feel I have misrepresented you. However, <laughs> um, I think that this everything here is going to come down to what we think first comes first, the chicken or the egg. And I feel that everyone's going to say, if you have yours, then you'll have everything. Um, but I, I think that coming from a spiritual standpoint, um, that that's always going to be what comes first. And I, I think that's what, we ca what we've all said, basically, collaboratively. If you have a faith, then you're going to be more willing to go out on the edge. You're going to be more accepting of the fact that you feel there's a safety net, whether it comes from a religion, anywhere you have faith if you have faith you feel like you're not on your own so i think your support system comes from having a faith because or a spiritual connection with someone because you feel supported by them i think your role models can come out of having a spiritual connection because you're going to meet people in that realm i think that financially obviously coming from 
a, a standpoint of Christianity, we feel that our faith contributes to our financial well-being and our financial health. And I think emotionally, spiritual and emotional things go hand in hand. It's hard to say. I think that really emotional and spiritual could be one if you do have a faith. So I think if you're talking about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, probably ch- probably spirituality. <laughs> Okay, next we have role models. Okay. Um, so we talked, we're the um, role model group, and we said that, no offense, um, support systems. <laughs> we said that a support system to us just kind of seemed more like not as um, personal kind of seemed like I think we used the example of like a pamphlet kind of like a just like a big group not and we felt like a role model was more like a friend or a relative or not even we said that it could be not just an older person or a parent or a teacher but even like someone younger than us so someone that you shared the same that you wanted to be like and we said that it could bring in all of these like the mental and the spiritual the emotional and the support that you felt from that person and that you felt that you could go to them and that you wanted to talk to them or um, look up to them. And we said that role models sometimes can have like a negative side because the role models that we often think of are like um, famous people or star athletes, but really those people aren't really role models that you can get assurance from or um, kind of like, I don't know what I'm looking for here. Yes, pass. <laughs> we also talked about how in our modern culture, there's a lot of negative stereotypes associated with being in poverty. And because of the way that our media and all the cultural things in our lives work, there's a lot of like, there's not a lot of positive role models for people. And so people sort of end up sort of per- per- yeah, perpetuating these stereotypes because they go like, all right, this is how I'm supposed to be because I'm in poverty. So to be able to show people that you don't have to perpetuate the stereotype, that you can be whoever you want to be, you can have any kind of positive trait that you want to, um, is a good motivator for people to be motivated. All right, so we were thinking that the biggest step to making a change, pulling yourself out of poverty, would be for yourself, your mental change, who you are, what you think you need to do. Um, you make a decision that you need to, you know, put something different in your life, um, and then start creating plans and processes to put that in motion. Figure out what your life goals are, what you want to do, figure out your, um, your savings plan, your financial plan, how you're going to budget your money to help start pulling yourself out of the hole. Um, you know, your education, what are you going to be focusing on to move yourself towards what you want to do? What do you want to learn to make what you want happen? Um, you know, just mentally, you need to have your own mindset in place before you do anything else because that's, that's really what's going to be uh, putting you on track. Um, anything else, guys? Yeah, and we thought that support systems would help, but that some people tend to use that as crutches. So um, same thing with role models uh, or support systems. We thought those could be negative as well, and not just positive necessarily. So mentally, we thought would be the best. (laughs) (laughs) And and I think one of the key things that you guys said earlier was that mental piece. Um, If you don't have the capacity, you think about um, people who won the the lottery, um, people who hit the the movie art art role models that we want stars, movie stars. Um, they have a lot of money, but if you don't have a lot of sense, it doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't help. Um, but just for a minute, I want you to think about some of the things that have happened historically, because I want to, I'm going to take you back to, um, let's say after um, 
women began going into, let's say, the uh, late 40s, after Pearl Harbor was bombed and women went into the workforce, the, there were fewer mothers at home um, taking care of the children because they had to work. Um, that would probably look like something like a um, support system. Where are our support systems? Our support systems are getting a little weaker because we don't have that, the mom at home. Around the, the 60s, we have um, a higher use of drug use and um, there's a lot of love-ins and lots of stuff going on. Uh, and, and, and then there's probably an emotional breakdown. So if you wouldn't mind taking down that support system comes because that's weakening. Our emotional stability is weakening just a little bit, the 60s and 70s. We have crack babies are being born. Um, we have more uh, examples of mental illness. Can you take down mental because of um, the weakening support systems? And then, of course, we don't have much money to begin with, so I'm going to take this down. Um, because of people not having uh, the ability, the, the role models to go to church, we don't go to church every Sunday, and if we do, there's that profiteer preaching, you know, the, the preachers for profit now, so our, even our spiritual base isn't what it used to be, because people are trying to be financially, if you'll take that down for me. If you think about it, what we're dealing with when we're looking at poverty is not just a lack of finances and support systems, um, but a lack of a multiplicity of things. So we have people with serious mental illness issues raising children, so that for them, that's the norm. They begin to imitate or act like what they're around all the time. So our job is a little harder in this, in, in, in this century because of that is not what it was 20 years ago. We all know that, and that's why. So when we think about poverty now, we're not thinking about just money, but a lack of these kinds of things that are so important anyway. So if you go, go back to your seats, I have about 10 more minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah! <laughs> um, you know, actually, role models was, in, in all the books, is that um, the one thing that researchers agree on, thank you, that makes the biggest difference. I didn't want to taint that. It is. Yep. The researchers do believe that role models makes the difference. Of course, it has to be the positive role models, because you could have those role models and support systems that consist of gangs. Um, and All right, so I want to talk to, uh, the, uh, and just as an aside, when I had you go out into those groups, when we're talking about differentiation, because that was, was what we were supposed to be talking about anyway, I differentiate it based on interest. So you don't have to just differentiate based on um, skill level. It's not always the greens, the yellows, and the reds. It could just be those who are interested in certain things, because we learn a lot about each other when we get into groups um, with the same kind of topic that we're willing to talk about, like the spiritual group. I think you guys had a pretty decent conversation over there. There were fewer of you, and you knew what you were talking about. Okay, um, kids from poverty are talking about that they get less attunement time, which means that reciprocity, that back, back and forward uh, conversation, it's mostly uh, directives, this is what you do, this is what you do, as opposed to having a conversation. And uh, lots of research tells you that the uh, simple reading of books, if you read to your classroom, it doesn't matter what grade level you teach, but that reading gives them that richer language because they won't have that language development. I, I can remember um, <laughs> when we were taking some of the tests, it was just a middle schooler at, it was this really um, simple, question, it was, oh, okay, yes. He was taking the test at the beginning of the year, and it was like, um, the question asked, which of these four things should you not do during uh, a, jo a job interview? And one of them was check your phone, and he was like, um, check your phone? But he thought that you should be able to check your phone, because you want to make sure that it's not on during your job interview. So he didn't list that as one of the things you should not do. So and just that whole thought process. It just made perfect sense for him to check his phone 
during a job interview to make sure it didn't go off. Now, is it, do you understand how that was like, just because he didn't have the tools to think that through? Of course, you know, it sounds like it, it, was, it was obvious the wrong answer, but he just didn't understand why it was the wrong answer. But um, that having that harmonious relationship with the primary caregiver is probably going to come mostly from you. Um, one of the things Eric Jensen shared with us is that we are hardwired, and please don't feel like you can't disagree with me. If you disagree, let me know. We can have that conversation. But we're hardwired with um, only six emotions, and that sadness. Do you know how you look at a baby and go, and they can mimic that sadness? Uh, joy, when you smile, they smile. Disgust, ugh, it's nasty. They understand that right away. Anger, you have that mad face and they know how to get angry and surprise. And fear, like ooh. Those things are kind of like natural with babies and, and they get that. But then there's humility, forgiveness, empathy, optimism, sympathy, patience, cooperation. Those things don't come hardwired. So those are the things that have to be taught and have to be taught over and over and over again. I remember that one of the teachers said to me the first year Snipes opened up was when the kids came, they were like, um, the children here just don't seem like they appreciate this brand new building and these lights that walk on, come on when you walk in the building and go off when you walk out. And um, yeah, probably not because they're five, six, seven years old, they don't appreciate it because for one, they haven't been taught appreciation. You think about how many times, and I notice this because I have grandchildren, you tell them, uh, say thank you, and they say thank you, but they're just saying words. They don't really understand how to really be appreciative of the act. Someone just did something for you that took time and they don't really understand. And unless you talk about it with them, even regular folks don't. I mean, not just folks from poverty, but we don't sometimes understand the sacrifice it takes for someone and you're actually saying thank you. Anyway, but those things have to be taught, which is why when we have co cooperation, those cooperative groups, when we ask you, oh, let's do cooperative groups, one of the biggest complaints that teachers have is, I gotta let them go? I can't, I have control over them right here. I can't let them go into cooperative groups. Well, you can't, because those skills have to be taught by themselves, like how to cooperate, what that looks like to cooperate. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> um, because of that, uh, that, I gotta go back here one more time because I wanted to um, also talk about the, when you have that angry parent that comes and wants to talk to you and they really can't talk to you. They can't, under, they can't explain, they're going straight to anger because they don't understand that they're confused or disappointed or understand how to manipulate that thought process for um, maybe a little uh, humiliation because they feel like they've done less of a parent. Well, you have because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But because they don't understand how to deal with those emotions and they don't have the words for it, they go straight to anger. And because of that, so do their kids. There was a little girl that, was, um, that came to me, a mother that came to me this summer and was complaining about a little girl fighting, wanting to fight her daughter on the bus. So she came to me and she said, well, if, she, if you don't do anything about it, I'm just going to beat her up and her mama. I said, okay, so you're going to fight to stop the fighting. That doesn't even make sense. But she came to me because she needed help. She didn't know how to say that and she couldn't articulate that. So we had to work through that, but I couldn't work through the parent because she's already grown and an adult and in the working world. So I had to work that, work that through with the, with the child. And it has, it's taken, all right, we had to spend, I spent about three or four hours with her, kind of talking through some things. And I had to get to the bottom of some other things and go around the back door for, to get to some emotional things and realize what's going on in her life. Then it's gonna take that follow up because it's not gonna happen overnight. It didn't get there overnight. So we're not gonna fix it overnight. So I, I just that, that whole emotional piece is a big piece. <clears throat> um, in schools that succeed every day, that something is done differently. So if we do the same thing every day and we're getting those, and we're not getting any results, 
Um, you know the definition of that, right? There's a definition of that. When we do the same thing, expecting different results. So the student has to have something that makes them feel like they're a little bit better off than the day before. And that's really hard sometimes because most often than not, the students don't want, they, they, you, you feel like they must not want to be liked because of the way they're behaving. They, they can't be, <laughs> but they do. They do want to feel safe. They want to be valued, feel, feel, feel valued. So the way to do that is kind of different activities. Make something that they can make um, feel successful in. I'm gonna ask you to do a, a quick little activity. You're gonna, around, yeah, we're all, all at tables, it's good. We're gonna just tell, each other, tell a story. And you're gonna start with one person um, at the table. Doesn't matter who, oh, let's say whose birthday is closest to today. They'll be the first one. So you're gonna just tell a story. You're gonna start with one. The next person's gonna say one day. The next one is gonna say one day when. So you take that very first word and everybody has to say the first word. The second person has to say the first word and the second word. The person, third person has to say the first, second, and third. Fourth has to, you get it? And then everybody has to, until you complete um, something. Just like make some sense of something, all right? See how far you can go. All right, you ready? You got it? Anyone? Um, could somebody volunteer to share there? Can you do it? Let's hear it. I can imagine it's awesome coming from that group. That that's incredible. <laughs> Very positive, uplifting. <laughs> Anybody else want to share theirs? Did it go crazy wild in the back? That's cool. Anybody else? Do it. Believe it or not, that's one way that, that a kid can feel successful because they've completed something. That's pretty awesome to get through it. It's like running a race when you don't have to run, but to remember that, that's a lot to remember. So it's a small step, and it doesn't have to be the sharpest knife in the draw that gets it. It's, you just, just stick with it. Um, that's one of the things that is suggested by engaging students from poverty is to have them engage in some type of memory building um, activity because that working memory often when uh, your your brain is stressed you know how you lose your car keys and you can't, really can't think of anything else that's what happens to a, a, a kid from poverty who is constantly under stress they don't have the capacity to remember things long term nor the desire because they're so worried about a lot of things happening everywhere else um, the instability that goes along with that and the chaos, the, it's a lot. Anyway, so some of those things that, that would give that encouraging um, feedback would be like the writing process. You have students who will write three pages and others that will write three words. So the writing process will give you that opportunity to work with them, to, com to do conferences. That, not that you're expected to do this every day, but that talk about differentiation, you're able to do that because that one that can go on their own will go on their own, but that having that, the writing process to give them that support um, for those difficult tasks will help. That meta thinking, like think about your thinking. Where'd you get your answer? Thinking maps. Um, because you haven't gone in the classrooms yet, you, don't, you probably don't know what your schools support. But many schools in New Hanover County support the thinking maps. And the thinking maps are really good, but what's even better is that little box on the outside of the thinking maps when they have to explain where did you get that thought from. They can't just give an answer. Uh, for example, when they're giving, um, they have to give character traits on the bubble map, something like that. How do you know uh, he's, because they, like, they love to write that he's good, you know, or they're bad. But what makes them good? What makes them bad? Um, that numeracy, trying to understand the numbers and that, um, the connections with numbers. Social skills, it's always something that has to be explicit. 
they are not going to know how to work in cooperative groups. It just does not happen. And that's just a normal first grade, second grade, third grade kind of thing. It just, we don't often know how to work in groups. We have to know the people we're working with. We've got to get our personalities right. There's always a leader. Who's that leader? That kind of thing. We have to work those things out. But as adults, we do that very pretty well and fluidly in groups. We, we manage. Um, that phonological awareness piece, mostly for lowers, but it's not going to be out of the question for your middle school folks in the scientific method. That, so it's not that guesswork. The scientific method, is, you know, you ask the questions and you answer that question because um, most kids are all over the place. And then the mapping and memory and study skills. Um, does Cornell note? No, it's something else. It's, do, what are those notes that you can use? Yeah, those are, those are the ones now that they use and that helps a whole lot. And again, mapping. If you don't use thinking maps because your school doesn't require you, develop, uh, find something that you can use that you use systematically throughout the year that they recognize. So when they see it, it's like, oh, okay, that's the way I'm supposed to think. Um, many schools use runners um, to identify um, information and text so that they can test better. What was that at Virgo we used runners? Won't. I won't. <laughs> but as long as you have a plan and that it's const that you're, you're um, consistent, that's the key. Just kind of stay consistent. Um, this all leads me to the thought of mindset. First of all, you have to have the mindset once you go in, but then you have to develop that mindset within your, your, um, your students. So I just want to show this quick little um, video about mindset. What do you think is the key to achieving our goals, our success? Some people suggest things like hard work, focus, persistence. But research shows these are all byproducts of something else, something much more powerful that we can all develop. It is this very special something that really is critical to success and is what I'm here to discuss with you today. Someone who has achieved great success is Josh Waitzkin a chess international master and the subject of the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Nobody has won all the national chess championships that Josh has. But even more impressive, when he turned 21, he took on the challenge of mastering something completely new and very different from chess, martial arts. He realized that he had learned how to grow and succeed, and he could apply that understanding to other domains. And so, he devoted himself relentlessly to Tai Chi Chuan. And after lots of hard work, many failures, and some broken joints, he became a great martial artist and he won two world championships. Now he's off to Jiu Jitsu. So what does Josh say is the greatest thing that ever happened to him? Believe it or not, he says, losing my first national chess championship because it helped me avoid many of the psychological traps. The key trap that Josh avoided was believing that he was special, that he was smarter than other people and that he didn't have to work hard. He could have thought of himself as a prodigy, but he doesn't think that he has extraordinary intelligence. He says, the moment we believe that success is determined by an ingrained level of ability, we will be brittle in the face of adversity. Josh often quotes Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who discovered that some people see intelligence or abilities as fixed, what is called a fixed mindset, while other people see them, as Josh does, as qualities that can be developed, a growth mindset. More important, Dr. Dweck discovered that these two different mindsets lead to very different behaviors and results. In a study she did with Dr. Lisa Blackwell, Several hundred seventh graders were surveyed to determine which mindset each student had, and then they were tracked for two years. Results showed that the students with a growth mindset, those who thought they could change their own intelligence, increased their grades over time, while those with a fixed mindset did not. You can see the trend. The gap in performance just widens and widens over time. The difference between these two groups? A different perspective on intelligence. Other studies have shown similar effects for our mindset about other abilities, like problem solving, playing sports, managing people, or anything else you'd like. 
Dance la Macarena. The key to success is not simply effort or focus or resilience, but it is the growth mindset that creates them. The mindset itself is critical. Research shows that when we directly try to build grit or persistence, it is not nearly as effective as addressing the mindset that underlies them. How many of us think of ourselves as not math people, or creative, or sociable, or athletic, or conversely, that we're naturals? If we're to fulfill our potential, we have to start thinking differently. We have to realize that our, we're not chained to our current capabilities. Neuroscience shows that the brain is very malleable, and we can change our own ability to think and to perform. In fact, many of the most accomplished people of our era were thought of by experts to have no future. People like Charles Darwin, Lucille Ball, Marcel Proust, and many others. But they, along with all great achievers, from Mozart to Einstein, built their abilities. But the key insight that I would like you to walk away with today is that when we realize that, when we realize that we can change our own abilities, when we have a growth mindset, we bring our game to new levels. So how does a growth mindset do that? It turns out that there are physiological manifestations to mindset. Brain scans show that for people with a fixed mindset, the brain becomes most active when receiving information about how the person performed, such as a grade or a score. But for people with a growth mindset, the brain becomes most active when receiving information about what they could do better next time. In other words, people with a fixed mindset worry the most about how they're judged, while those with a growth mindset focus the most on learning. There are other consequences of mindset. People with a fixed mindset see effort as a bad thing, something that only people with low capabilities need, while those with a growth mindset see effort as what makes us smart, as the way to grow. And when they hit a setback or failure, people with a fixed mindset tend to conclude that they're incapable. So to protect their ego, they lose interest or withdraw. We observe that as lack of motivation, but behind it is a fixed mindset. Whereas people with a growth mindset understand that setbacks are part of growth. So when they hit one, they find a way around it, like Josh Waitzkin did when he lost in chess or in martial arts. Research clearly shows these effects of mindset. In one study that Dr. Dweck did with Dr. Claudia Mueller, they had children do a set of puzzles. And then they praised the kids. To some of the kids, they said, well, that's a really good score. You must be smart at this. That's fixed mindset praise because it portrays intelligence or abilities as a fixed quality. To other kids, they said, wow, that's a really good score. You must have tried really hard. That's growth mindset praise because it focuses on the process. Then they asked the kids, OK, what kind of puzzle would you like to do next, an easy one or a hard one? The majority of the kids who received the fixed mindset praise chose to do the easy puzzle, while the great majority of those who received the growth mindset praise chose to challenge themselves. Then, all the re then the researchers gave a hard puzzle to all of the kids because they were interested in seeing what confronting difficulty would do to their performance. Look at what happened when the kids later went back to the set of easier problems that they started with. The kids who received the fixed mindset praise did significantly worse than they had originally, while those who received the growth mindset praise did better. And to top it off, at the very end, kids were asked to report their scores. And the kids who received the, growth, the fixed mindset praise lied about their scores over three times more often than those who received the growth mindset praise. They did not have another way to cope with their failure. The difference between these two groups? One short little sentence. How often do we praise kids for being smart or for being great at something? We've been told that this will raise their self-esteem, but instead, it puts them in a fixed mindset. They become afraid of challenges, and they lose confidence when things get hard. As Josh Waitzkin says, it is incredibly important for parents to make their feedback process-related, as opposed to praising or criticizing talent. If we win because we're a winner, then when we lose, it must make us a loser. These studies show not only the mechanisms by which mindset affects performance, but they also show something else that's very important. They show that we can change mindsets. And that's important because most of us have fixed mindsets about something. Another study that showed that we can change mindsets is one in which Dweck and Blackwell 
did a workshop with seventh graders to instill a growth mindset in them. As a result of the workshop, the students gained more interest in learning and they worked harder. And as a result of that, their grades improved. Other studies have shown that when we teach a growth mindset, not only does it improve achievement for students as a whole, but it also narrows the achievement gap because the effects are most pronounced for the students who face negative stereotypes, such as minority students and girls in math. I've spoken mostly about children, but mindset affects all of us. In our workplaces, managers with fixed mindsets don't welcome feedback as much, and they don't mentor employees as much. And employees with growth mindsets about specific skills, like negotiations, become far better at those skills than people with fixed views. Mindsets can even help us solve big social issues. A recent study showed that when we expose Israelis and Palestinians to the idea that groups can change, they increase their attitudes toward one another, they improve them, and they enhance their willingness to compromise and to work for peace. We also see the effects of mindsets on relationships, sports, health. How is it possible that as a society, we're not asking schools to develop a growth mindset in children? Our myopic efforts to teach them facts, concepts, and even critical thinking skills is likely to fail if we don't also deliberately teach them the essential beliefs that will allow them to succeed, not only in school, but also beyond. There's a lot that we can do to change mindsets, but here are three things that any of us can do to instill a growth mindset in ourselves and in those around us. First, recognize that the growth mindset is not only beneficial, but it's also supported by science. Neuroscience shows that the brain changes and becomes more capable when we work hard to improve ourselves. Second, learn and teach others about how to develop our abilities. Learn about deliberate practice and what makes for effective effort. When we understand how to develop our abilities, we strengthen our conviction that we're in charge of them. And third, listen for your fixed mindset voice. And when you hear it, talk back with a growth mindset voice. If you hear, I can't do it, add yet. My request to you today is that you share this knowledge about the growth mindset with your family, friends, and schools, so that all of us can go and fulfill our potential. Thank you. Team, <laughs> swoop in, help. <laughs> um, but if there's anything that you want to delve deep, deeper in throughout the year, I'd be glad to have a PLC with anybody interested in it, whether it's the mindset, the poverty, or differentiation. I try to kind of put everything that I'm passionate about into one hour, just so that you can kind of just plant some seeds. I just want to plant some seeds. And that way, if you hear it again, or it comes across someplace, you're like, oh yeah. And then it's bound to be something you want to go deeper with. And if I can go deeper with you, just let me know. I'm ready to dive. Um, any aha moments or anything you want to talk about, share, put out there about what you heard? I've, I've listened to this like eight times. I thought I knew a lot about it. And I think that um, it, it takes practice um, to hear it all the time. Oh, yeah, you see it. Yes. Yeah. Because I immediately, I have grandbabies now, so I immediately called my daughter when I heard this. Like, yeah, look, this is what we're going to do <laughs> from here on out. We're going to start right now. Yeah. And tell yourself, I didn't get it yet. Absolutely. Think about some of the uh, young girls that you're going to face in middle school, elementary even, who are adults at home, and they come to you with that adult voice. That's because they're adults 20, more than 20 some hours a day and all summer long. So it's not personal. Well, I thank you so much for your time. Yep.